Welcome back to John Author's Note. For the past couple of decades, academics and policymakers have generally assumed that the free movement of capital is a good thing for development. Yet, a few financial crashes later, many, including the International Monetary Fund, are asking themselves a different question. As Monty Python would have put it, what has financial openness ever done for us? Discussing this with me today is Helen Ray, a professor of economics at the London Business School. Let's have a look at the first chart you brought with you, Helen. Um, and this is showing uh, how countries have really gone for financial, for, the, for opening their uh, capital accounts and, uh, over the last 40 years. Um, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we have a, an index of financial openness. And we can see the line is, is going up. Exactly. What has been uh, pretty remarkable is that in the last 40 years or so, we have seen a tremendous amount in uh, increasing of financial openness. And that has been true both for developed countries, which um, you know, are now at very high level of financial openness, and also developing countries, which started from a lower base, but as we can see from the graph, are trying to catch up. This index goes from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. Now, what is the evidence in terms of the correlation between financial openness and uh, economic growth or development? So this is a very interesting aspect of all this uh, trend in financial opening. On the one hand, we have quite a few economic theories which tend to tell us that there are tremendous potential benefits to financial openness. And no doubt, this is behind the mind of policymakers when they recommend to countries to open up their financial account. So on the one hand, we are used to thinking that financial openness is good for increasing the efficient allocation of capital across countries. Some, capital are capital some countries are capital scarce, other countries are capital abundant. So there has to be an improvement if you allow capital to free from capital abundant country to capital scarce country. And then when we look at the data. And increase growth, and increase growth. So that's, that's clearly one benefit that, you know, uh, economic theory tell us clearly should be there. But actually, when we look at the data, that's the point. It has been remarkably elusive, this benefit. It's very, very hard to find actually robust evidence telling us, yes, financial opening increases growth. So it should be there, but it's not there. It should be there. Sometimes we find it. So in some samples for some type of countries, some periods we find it, but it's very hard to find very robust evidence of that. Whereas if we look at the downside and the risks, well, we can go to the second slide. We see that there is a lot of volatility in uh, uh, capital inflows. These are capital inflows uh, in liquidity receiving economies. And especially over the last few years, there has been uh, remarkable volatility. Now, wha what's driving it? So the second uh, very uh, typically hailed benefit of capital flow should be that it it's, uh, enables better risk sharing. So that means, you know, if uh, countries are uncorrelated in their economic activities, if some countries are booming while others are in recession, then it's really good to, to be able to share risk. So you allocate your portfolio across different countries, and therefore financial openness is good. It should enable you to decrease the overall risk in the economy. But what we uh, are seeing again is very little evidence in favor of this additional benefit, the risk sharing benefit. Again, evidence not robust across countries, depending on the sample, maybe some threshold effect, consumption volatility decreasing, only if you have the right institutions and things like that, but it's very hard to find, again, a consistent result in the data. And what we do see in the data is that there is a remarkable procyclicality in some type of capital flows. In particular, if we look here at bank loans, you see the yellow bars. They tend to be much larger in boom times and to be negative in bad times. Which is exactly what you wouldn't want. Now exactly, they amplify the risk. What are the policy implications of, of all this for so policymakers? Certainly, as we have seen in, I, in Europe and as we have seen also in emerging markets, so if there are these uh, amplification mechanisms which are built in short-term capital flows like bank credit and the short-term debt flows, what you want is to control that, to dampen that, because we, this might lead to real estate bubbles, this, must have a lot of, this may have a lot of distortion in economies that we do not want. Hence, the move towards maybe temporary capital controls, which now the IMF has also been uh, promoting, and within the euro area, uh, the importance of macroprudential measures. Thank you very much for being with us today, Helen. So the optimal level of financial openness 
is the new holy grail in the world of international finance. Let's just hope policymakers find it before the next crash.